So I want you to raise your hand if you or someone you know, maybe your mom, maybe your grandma, has owned a Betty Crocker cookbook. Do we have 100% participation? Almost. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, now I want you to raise your hand if you've purchased a cookbook in the last year. Okay, decent amount. Now I want you to raise your hand if you have cooked from a cookbook in the last month. Well, this must be a food-engaged audience. This is good. Um, how about raise your hand if you've looked at an app in the last two hours? Today. Any app. Any app. Okay, I think we've got 100% there. So thank you. You guys just set up my presentation. And this is a different clicker. Okay, so um, I'm Audra Carson. I work in our own medium publishing group at General Mills. And think of my group as a publishing house inside of a house of brands. And so um, I have responsibility for a portfolio of owned um, media assets, both branded and unbranded, um, with the goal to bring in unique audiences for General Mills brands. So while Betty Crocker and Pillsbury compete with the All Recipes and the Food Networks of the World, um, we also have our Tablespoon and our K-Rica Vita platforms that are designed to go after the millennial audience, for example, on Tablespoon, or the Hispanic audience, for example, on K-Rica Vita. Um, and while my business card says marketing, I actually consider myself to be in sales. So it is my job, it is the job of our group to drive sales for General Mills brands by incorporating brand content into the, or brands, excuse me, into the content that we produce and then distributing that content to um, digital relationships that we create at scale. And so that's a, it's a really fun job, I love it. Um, and so enough about me, let's talk about Betty Crocker. So Betty Crocker was actually born by a bunch of advertisers in the 1920s, and many consider her to be the first lady of food. Um, but you could also probably consider her to be the first lady of content marketing, too. So um, distributing things like branded recipes and advice um, through letter mail, through her radio show, and through the iconic Betty Crocker Big Red Cookbook, which we've sold over 75 million copies. And while our publishing business is still, our cookbook publishing business is still alive and well, um, and cookbooks are still in the cupboards of many people, many of you in the audience here today, um, apps are a far more convenient tool for today's modern cook. And so that's what I'm here to talk about today. Next one. So apps are really nothing new to Betty Crocker. In fact, we were the first food content publisher to come out with an app. Um, in 2008, um, we were number one in the food and drink space for many years running. We even had the benefit of Apple promoting us. We were in their first TV commercial when they first introduced apps to the world. Um, and uh, we kind of lost our way a little bit. So while we were working on this app, um, our competitors were, um, they were working on mobile web and um, we, excuse me, I lost my thought here for a minute. <laughs> um, so, and think about that, 2008, that was before mobile web even existed, right? And that was before the penetration of smartphones, that hockey stick penetration. So, in retrospect, we were probably a bit ahead of our time. And so, um, from then to now, while we have been working on mobile web and responsive web, our competitors have really been working on apps. And we have moved from that number one position to not even cracking the top 100. Um, and so, it was important for us to invest in responsive web, it was important for our competitors to invest in apps, and we fell behind. And so we needed to change and we needed to adapt. I gotta throw an adapt thing in there. So um, consumers have changed a lot since 2008 and we have learned a lot since 2008. So today, I'm really just gonna share my story about this app and kind of the three truths that have never failed me in my content marketing journey and that we leveraged along the way of building this new app. The first is knowing or getting to know your consumer. The second is just being useful, always being useful, um, and then staying committed. And I know that these are very simple things. You all already know these things, but I'll bring them to life a bit as I tell my story. So we debated even with an installed base of three million devices for this app, we debated just shutting it down. We're like, do we really need, even need to have an app? You know, our, web is, our mobile web is growing, our social platforms are growing, our email lists are growing, why do we even need an app? And then we took a step back and we said, you know, do we even really know the app user? Do we know the app user in the space? And, and we didn't have the answer to that question. So before we shut it down, uh, we looked at some data. So we sourced a first party stud, study through CrowdTap um, as well as leveraged our friends at Comscore. And we found that seven in 10 consumers are actually cooking with their device. Raise your hand, I didn't do this one. Raise your hand if you have cooked for, 
planned for a meal or shopped for a meal with your device in the last, everybody, right? People are using their devices. Um, and we learned that while uh, mobile usage of recipe content is growing significantly, 31%, app usage for recipe content is actually growing faster than web usage, which is really interesting. A lot of that's being driven by Pinterest, of course. And that a third of people who are accessing recipes via their mobile devices are going in through apps. And that millennials are more than half of recipe app users. So you spot off a statistic like that on millennials and the funding just follows, right? Um, but is that really enough information for us to go ahead and um, rebuild our app upon? Probably not. So before we put any ideas to paper, even for how we were going to adapt our app, um, we knew we needed to go on a consumer learning journey. And you can, might say, ooh, consumer learning journey, that sounds really expensive, it sounds like that might take a lot of time, um, and it really doesn't have to. So literally, we paid people $20, we gave them a Target gift card, um, both our employee panel at General Mills and a consumer advisory board that we leverage on a frequent basis. We gave them 20 bucks and we said, go buy some groceries, go make a meal with your phone with your tablet and come back to us and tell us about that experience. And we learned a ton. Um, the, the biggest thing being that there's, there's no shortage of food content out there. Um, there. It's everywhere you look, everywhere you go. And people are having a hard time sorting through the clutter. How many of you have ever gotten drunk on Pinterest? Anybody? Like you just keep going, there's like steaks next to frittatas, next to memes, and you're like, oh my god, what am I looking at? There's just so much out there. There's actually a term for that, it's called penebriated. Have you heard that one? No, now you know, okay. And then people actually get frustrated and then they usually just end up at search. And so why you know, get into an app or why, why get into one of these things when all you could have done to start with is, is gone to Google, right? And so there's gotta be value there. Um, we also learned from consumers that they do not want um, providers to give them tools for grocery lists or for coupons. They've got their own system. It's really unique to the individual or there are existing apps and tools out there that they're already using. Um, but another thing too, and everyone's heard of the, I'm not meaning to pick on Pinterest, I'm an avid user, but everyone's heard of the hashtag Pinterest fail, right? So with all this food content out there, there's really some skepticism around, can I do this? Will the recipe even turn out? Um, and so that's, that's important to consumers too. Quality is important to them. And then, interestingly enough, this rose to the top of our CrowdTap study, the earlier one that I was mentioning, but people hate it. They're cooking with their device. They hate it when their screen goes dim or locks. You know, they might have a spoon in hand. There might be some mess. That really just bothers them. And then, um, as much as I love my phone, it's a distraction. So you might be cooking from your device, and a text message comes in, or you get a Facebook update, and that can be distracting. You can lose your place inside of the recipe. Um, so we, we took all of this data, um, and we started to beta test some concepts. And then we had consumers go back and test again, $20 again. So $20 a pop, just getting more and more um, data from our consumers in terms of are we delivering on their need of cooking in the kitchen. So the other piece, the second truth, is just being useful, right? So people set up the problems. How can we deliver a solution to meet their needs? And the first thing that we identified that we were gonna focus on, and I think utility often is being purposeful and being focused, right? So what are we going to do and what are we not going to do? And we decided that Betty Crocker as a brand and based on our history, that we were in a position that we could uniquely connect consumers to quality recipes that they could actually make. So quality recipes that they can actually make. And then secondly, um, we could help them improve the experience of cooking with the device in the kitchen. Notice I didn't say, planning for a meal. Notice I didn't say shopping for a meal. Cooking with the device in the kitchen. And that became our narrow focus, and I'll show you how that played out in terms of um, the app content. So content, everybody's got content. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should take your content and turn it into an app. In fact, there's a lot of um, food manufacturers out there that have apps that are literally glorified search tools, which was in fact the app that we used to have was a glorified search tool. Um, so our content inside of this app, again, 15,000 recipes, all the recipes that we ever have, we're adding new ones all the time, all of them kitchen tested. But I think the biggest deal, and this sounds super simplistic, but the recipes are organized by chapter. So if you think about that universal truth of cookbook behavior and how we've been designed over the years to say, oh, I'm gonna make a dessert, let me go to the dessert tab of my cookbook. Um, so that's how we're presenting the content. 
Um, another cool feature is that users can actually create their own chapters. So if there's recipes that they make again and again that they want to go back to, um, rather than you know flipping over a page of a, a cookbook, they can you know favorite it, hang on to it. They've got their own chapter right there in the app. And then um, we'd be remiss if we excluded search all the way together. But if somebody gets to the, the bottom of our chicken chapter and they don't find what they're looking for, which I'd be hard pressed if they didn't because we leverage data to create these chapters, um, we help them refine their search to say, oh, you want chicken with cheese or you want an Italian chicken? Uh, and we'll get you to the recipe that you need. So cooking, let's talk about cooking. So I mentioned this before, but again, number one pain point is that the screen won't dim or lock. So we actually solve for this. You can't solve for this inside of a web browser. You can't solve for this inside of mobile web, but because apps are native to your device, you can actually solve for this type of consumer need. Um, to my knowledge, we're the only app that is actually doing this right now, although I went and did a PR tour at Meredith and they were like taking frivolous notes, so they're probably doing it by now too at all recipes. But um, the other piece is checking ingredients and steps as you go. So we mentioned that distraction of being on a device and maybe working your way through the process of a meal. Um, letting consumers actually say, oh, that step's complete, oh, that step's complete, so they're not losing their place. What's great about this, and I mentioned that I consider myself to be in sales, um, I can actually see if somebody has completed steps one through five of a recipe, and if there's green giant vegetables inside of that recipe, I can post a sale for my brands and communicate that back to the team. Um, making recipe adjustments right inside the app, not having to go back out and go to Google or somewhere else to find that information. And then, of course, the, the native sending and sharing with friends. And we know things like saying, you know, working through the steps of the ingredients of the recipes or sharing with their friends. Um, both of those activities have very strong purchase intent that we can correlate positively with sales. So that's being useful. Um, but the third truth is really all about staying committed. So, not just doing an app for the sake of doing an app, and we've talked a lot about that this, this week too, not just going on Pinterest to be there, or not just going on Instagram to be there, um, but really setting a goal for what is this app going to deliver for us. And so we feel that we need to mirror our position on the web in the app space. So we're gonna try really hard, we've gotta earn our way back in, but we wanna be in that top 10 position in the food and drink app space. Um, I also mentioned bringing in new audiences. So using different mediums to bring in new audiences. We know millennials are using apps. We are monitoring and measuring what percentage of millennials are using this app. And really our goal is how do we engage the next generation of Betty Crocker brand champions um, through delivering our content in a new way. Um, the other piece is really designing for future marketing. So not setting ourselves up for kind of a one and done app launch, but how can we constantly be delivering news that will get people's attention over time? And so um, we've set ourselves up for um, seasonal chapters. So in the fall, let's release our fall desserts chapter that's all about apples and pumpkins. And uh, we just had a Valentine's chapter that we released in the last uh, month here that Apple picked up on, right? And that gave us a marketing opportunity to be on the homepage of their food and drink section inside the app. So just these little marketing opportunities over time. Um, the other piece is really in auditing the user experience. We're kind of in constant beta on this experience. So literally every month at the end of the month, we are combing, this is like our social listening, we're combing the App Store comments and we're figuring out you know, what people like and what people aren't liking. And if there's missing functionality or missing content or if we could be presenting things in a different way. Um, and then we're turning that into kind of our pipeline of, of next releases. And that leads into my next point is really budgeting for that next release. So not going into a major investment like this and, and saying, okay, it's launched. If we build it, you know, they're gonna come and everything's gonna be awesome. But making sure that on a regular schedule, we're gonna, we're gonna push out updates to make sure that we're meeting those consumer needs. And then lastly, just understanding the audience. So I mentioned our goal is to attract the millennial audience. Um, how, do we, how do we know if we're doing that or not? Um, well, there's a great tool. I don't know how many of other people in the audience are, are working with apps, but it's a tool called Flurry Analytics. It's like the Google Analytics of apps. And it's a, it's a free tool. And um, it's really just a plugin that helps us understand not only all the makes of the recipes that are happening inside of our app by capturing that activity that I mentioned earlier, um, but who the audience is, um, what is the audience segment that's most engaged, 
And then what's great about that is we can then leverage that information to do some lookalike modeling and then go acquire even more uh, people to um, become a part of our app family. And I think, you know, as an almost 100-year-old brand, it's super important to stay committed, right? So, um, you know, I'm not sure that the, the cookbook business, although it is alive and well, I'm not sure that that will take us into the next 100 years. But um, being able to adapt and being able to take something that was old and turn it into something new to maintain relevancy with um, consumers is really, really important to us. So thank you. I've learned a ton from all of you in the last few days. Um, and hopefully you took something away from me here today, too. But um, really, these three truths have never failed me in my content marketing journey of knowing your consumer, being useful, and staying committed. And I wish you luck on your content journey. Thank you. <laughs>